Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Schaefer. I'm the director of the University of Oklahoma Urban Design Studio. The Urban Design Studio offers the Master of Urban Design and the Graduate Certificate in Design Entrepreneurship and Real Estate uh, at our campus in Tulsa. Anybody from Tulsa here this morning? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, our students and faculty collaborate uh, with community partners on service learning projects involving participatory planning, placemaking, and urban design. Our vision is to develop and promote a community of urban designers in Tulsa and in Oklahoma at large. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our next panel of speakers. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, unlike Ron, uh, I just met them about 33 minutes ago, <laughs> so I'm going to do my best with their, with their bios here. Um, <clears throat> on my left is uh, Jill Brown Delosier. Jill is the Vice President of Downtown Oklahoma City Partnership. Uh, downtown OKC Partnership helps support, program, and revitalize downtown districts in Oklahoma City. As Vice President, Jill oversees the district management and marketing um, for <coughs> OKC Partnership with a focus on research creating partnerships and educating the public on the importance of a strong city center. And Jill has been with downtown OKC for eight years and has 18 years of experience in fundraising, marketing, and public relations in Oklahoma City. <coughs> on uh, <coughs> Jill's left is Elena Madison. Elena is vice president with Project for Public Spaces. She's an urban planner with experience in planning and design of parks, plazas, campuses, and public spaces for civic and cultural institutions across the United States. With Project for Public Spaces, Elena leads the Southwest Airlines Heart of the Community Grant Program. She also leads PPS's international training and technical assistance for Central and Eastern Europe. And then finally, <clears throat> on the far left, Laura Hoagland. Laura serves as manager of community outreach with Southwest Airlines, where she leads the team responsible for strategically aligning and allocating Southwest's outreach investments with business priorities. For three years, she has managed the Southwest Airlines Heart of the Community Program and its mission to build connections that strengthen communities for a more resilient future. To date, the program has served over 20 innovative and transformative placemaking projects in the US and Mexico in partnership with Project for Public Spaces. So I believe uh, that uh, Laura is going to uh, start, and uh, I want you to help me welcome all three of them uh, to the Placemaking Conference. Thank you so much, Sean, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start our conversation this morning um, around the Southwest Airlines Heart of the Community program by talking about um, Southwest and, and who we really are as a company because I think it's really always helpful for people to first understand um, that, that piece of things. So by a show of hands, how many of you have flown Southwest? Ah, awesome! Well, thank you guys so much for being really wonderful customers. Um, in its 48th year service, Southwest is the nation's largest domestic carrier based on passengers carried, 120 million annually. And in peak travel season, Southwest operates 4,000 weekly um, departures among 99 destinations. Um, and we serve, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in 99 destinations in the United States and 10 additional countries. And our 60,000 employees are really dedicated to providing exemplary customer service, hospitality, and that fun-loving attitude um, I'm sure you guys all love us for. Um, the Southwest Airlines purpose really is to connect people to what's important in their lives through friendly, reliable, and low-cost air travel. And we are an airline that was really built on relationships, relationships between our employees, with our people, and with our customers. Um, and it's really important that I make that point because that's, that's really what sets us apart from any other airline in the industry and sets us apart from many best-in-class brands and companies um, across the globe. Um, and in 2012, we set out to develop a um, signature outreach program that would really be unique to Southwest and our purpose and our, and our culture um, as a company. And so there were also a number um, of key um, factors that we identified 
that we were looking for um, when starting our program. Um, and since we do um, service 100 markets and have customers and employees all over the country, we knew a program had to be really national in scope, but through focus groups and surveys with our employees, we also knew that these projects had to be um, very grassroots in nature. They had to, our, our employees said, they wanted to see impact in their own backyards. Um, and so we really wanted um, a program that had tangible, visible results that our employees could also be really hands-on with. Um, and that also really met the very unique needs of every single one of our communities. Um, and our employees really do love putting their hearts in action. They love getting out to the communities and volunteering. So if we were gonna do something, they had to be involved. Not only by giving their volunteerism and their time, but also leveraging their talent as well as their treasures. Um, and lastly, we also sought out to find a little bit of a white space where we could really make a name for us, ourselves as a, as a company. Um, and so we sought to identify an issue area that wasn't already highly saturated with big corporate dollars um, that we could immediately come into and start to develop a leadership role within that issue area. We did investigate a number of different um, issue areas, community, community, community development being one, and then really narrowed our focus to public space. Um, and what most attracted us to placemaking is that we really could have a tangible impact on the community's quality of life um, and yield social, economic, and environmental um, impacts through our investment. Um, we could also invest in lighter, quicker, cheaper interventions. Um, we are a low-cost carrier, so our community outreach budget is quite modest. And so lighter, quicker, cheaper interventions did allow us to be a meaningful contributor in the space. Um, it also allowed us to scale the program nationally, have a shorter grant term. Um, so speaking of a national scale, it allows us to have that annual um, grant period of accepting new um, projects into the program. And it allowed our partners to have the flexibility to really test and iterate and see really what the, resonated with the community. Um, and lastly, the community process felt like just a really authentic, genuine fit for the Southwest culture and who we are, again, as a company. Because listening to the community as the expert, that rang loud and clear to us. Um, because we just knew that the community members, those that were closest to the issues within their community, um, and those that were gonna be users of the, the new public space, those ideas were gonna be far better than any idea that Southwest um, could come up with on our own and far more sustainable as well. So in 2013, we tested the program model through three pilot projects in Detroit, Providence, and San Antonio. And then in 2014, we officially launched the program. And so for more than 40 years, the Southwest Heart has been about connecting people and championing communities by loving people, building resilience, and living responsibly. And the mission of the Heart of the Community program is to build connections to strengthen communities for a more resilient future. And we believe that public spaces are those connection points. Downtown squares, plazas, parks, and markets um, really are the true hearts of every community um, where our people call home and our customers love to visit. Um, and these are places for having fun, for conversing, for sharing ideas, for debating ideas, um, and for really sharing experiences with those around us. And through the program, um, we really aim to do three things. Help communities um, bring new life to their public spaces, raise awareness for placemaking as a mainstream approach, um, and also encourage activation, participation, and volunteerism in public spaces um, to really benefit local communities. Um, our process for seeking out and determining the projects that would be a part of our program was kind of twofold. Um, we had to create the creation of some basic giving guidelines, which really helped to narrow the focus of our funding and set parameters around that funding. And those were things like the projects had to be in communities that Southwest served um, and, or located in a downtown um, or central urban hub. Um, and also we prohibited the support of large capital campaigns or capital projects um, and also indoor public spaces or buildings um, were prohibited through our program. Um, and then the grant review criteria um, was really created based on those 
first initial projects um, and then has sort of been tailored and, um, and adapted over time as we've learned more about um, the very unique qualities and nature of, um, of the projects and partners that we work with. Um, so the pro proposed projects had to be impactful, um, they had to meet the needs of the community, uh, funding had to be used to really attract a diverse um, demographic and foster social um, interactions within their community. The applicant organization themselves um, had to have the capacity and leadership to complete the proposed project and really have a credible track record um, for executing successful projects and programs. Um, and then the proposed project had to be um, really achievable within a reasonable amount of time, ideally 12 months, um, given the available budget, and they had to have a clear timeline for execution, as well as a plan for monitoring and evaluation um, after their project was complete. And so to date, um, as Sean mentioned, we've supported 20 placemaking projects through the program. And last year, we also awarded um, subsequent funding to um, five of those projects to support continued evolution, growth, and sustainability of their efforts. Each project is incredibly unique, um, has its own set of challenges and successes and outcomes, and has really been a true pleasure for us at Southwest to see how each place continues to adapt to meet the changing needs of their community. And ultimately, the why behind the program for Southwest really does all come back to our purpose and our culture as a, as a company, um, and how much we value people, and how much we value our connections with one another. And we're so proud to have played a role in creating vibrant public spaces in the hearts of the communities in which we serve, um, alongside great partners like Project for Public Spaces and grant recipients like Downtown Oklahoma City Partnership. Um, so thank you, and now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Elena um, to share more about PPS's work with Southwest and our grant partners as part of the program. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. So um, my goal here is to tell you a little bit about how we work together in this program with Southwest and it, with partners like Downtown OKC and kind of help you see how this fits with the placemaking strategy and mythos and the idea of placemaking. Um, you know we can't do it alone. We always need partners. And as uh, practitioners, and um, I know some of you are public servants, and some of you are in the private sector, and some of you are students, you know that there is always need for more partners for implementation. There is always need for funding. So it was incredibly um, lucky for us to find a partner like Southwest Airlines that was really supporting the mission of placemaking and we had such a synergy of goals, both from a placemaking perspective, but also from the perspective of how that fit with um, Southwest goals as an organization. So we have a placemaking process that we have been using at Project for Public Spaces for probably the last 20 years. Um, we have been around as a nonprofit organization focused on public spaces since 1975. So it's a long time, and we've had the chance to evolve our approach and really um, come up with a process that we feel suits the goals of our projects well and gives us room to experiment and gives us room to make quick improvements, and sometimes these improvements fit within a larger scale um, capital improvements or larger scale, pla larger scale plans or longer term plans. So our goal has always been to make changes fast, um, to work with the community, but also leave room for evolution, leave room for additional improvements, and potentially leave room for bigger, bigger capital improvements if those are needed. So as Laura mentioned, for us, the principle has always been that the community is the expert. Um, we know that the people who work, play, live, go to school, shop in an area are the people who actually know what's going to work for them best from a public space perspective. And that doesn't mean for us that 
the community is going to come and do all the design. It's really about having a conversation and an understanding of what is needed and how we can put it together in a space that works well for everyone. We obviously use a variety of different tools to engage people in that process. With starting with your standard you know, workshop, you come to us, we have a conversation. And it's also part of our phased work within um, the Heart of Community program where we start with engagement, envisioning, and kind of taking some baseline measures of the public space and um, looking forward to how we actually want the space to fun function after improvement. And we use a whole variety of tools to engage people. Um, we do a lot of these quick pop-ups. I know we did them in um, Oklahoma City around Kerr Park. We do a lot of surveying. We actually um, compare people's responses versus observations of what they actually do in a public space sometimes because sometimes those two things are not the same and there needs to be some thought and understanding of how these are combining. And based on these um, engagement tactics and the work with our partners, we develop some initial plans for the space. So this is an example from another um, Heart of Community project in Philadelphia's City Hall Courtyard. So it's at the center of Philadelphia's City Hall Courtyard. And the project there was really about an existing space that needed to be spruced up. It needed some improvements. Not all of the improvements were within the purview of this interaction, so we focused on what was feasible within the Southwest grant and also what our partners from City Hall wanted to do. So we focused on mobile furniture, movable features that can be used for a variety of purposes, and we came up with these very initial designs. And then we actually went out and engaged with uh, Philadelphia's very vast designer, maker, fabricator, fabricator community. We ran a request for proposals. We had many applicants and many proposals. We selected a team working with Philadelphia's um, arts department, um, Department of Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy, which is kind of interesting that that's part of their goal to select the winning um, designer. And then we worked with the designer first to um, finalize the elements of the design and then to implement and actually install. Um, we had local volunteers. They were working with a um, school, um, high school program to train high school kids in landscaping and building and fabricating. So we worked with them together to install um, the feature in Philadelphia's courtyard and there everybody is on a stage with the ribbon and the giant scissors celebrating. And one really important part of this whole engagement in Philadelphia was that the goal of it was um, to really create some opportunities for diverse programming. The city of Philadelphia is very, very diverse. And the goal of one of the partners, there were many partners in the project, but one of the partners was the, uh, the Department of Arts and Culture, and they really wanted to give opportunities to diverse community groups to participate and be able to show what they do. So our first performers were the Philadelphia's uh, Gay Men's Choir, and a lot of other similar programs were part of what this program in uh, Philadelphia was about. So you can see that programming and management and evaluation were elements that continued way past the launch. This was not you know, a one-shot deal we come and celebrate. And in fact, all of our partners have been committed to continuing to program the space, continuing to manage the space, continuing to monitor the space, and actually collect information and data to make it better and improve it. And that has been a really important part of Heart of Community Program and a really important part for us because it gives us such incredible valuable lessons in place management, which is one of the things we've been talking more and more about. And really um, working with our partners to kind of learn from each other and really let their space evolve uh, because I believe that public spaces, because they're all about people, 
are places that evolve. They're not like architecture. They can't be static and they need to change and they need to change as the needs of the people who are using them are changing. So from this, I'm gonna show you very quickly one of our, actually our first pilot uh, with the Heart of the Community program in downtown uh, Detroit. It was, it's in a space called Campus Marshes. You see it on the slide behind me. And we started off with basically uh, creating this little plan for a, an urban beach, or if you will, you can just call it a sandbox, to activate one of the less used parts of Campus Marshes. So this is the little plan. And it was built literally within three months. It took three months from planning to um, everything in the ground. So they worked very, very quickly. And that was in 2013. So the, oh, 2014, pardon. 2014, right. So the beach actually opened the week the city of Detroit declared bankruptcy. And it was a very interesting juxtaposition. On one hand, um, the city obviously had a lot of trouble and there was a lot of anxiety. On the other hand, there was something really positive and very popular and really attractive to people that was open to everyone. And that was the big goal of the beach, to create a space that is not just gonna be for downtown workers and it's gonna be actually attractive to a variety of people, to families, and to the people of Detroit, you, you don't necessarily see downtown. So it worked. Um, we worked on certain features that were really intended to provide um, support and attraction for all these various groups, from kids to families to um, just people working downtown to visitors. And the, the arrival of the families was kind of the big reveal for us. We weren't sure if that's really going to work. Um, and it's become a really, really popular spot. But um, the other part of that story is that the folks at the Downtown Detroit Partnership who are managing and really uh, running this space keep changing it every year. There is a slow evolution. They keep updating the amenities. Part of it is because those chairs don't last forever when you have like half a million people come and sit in them. But the other part of it is that they're constantly looking for what is going to make the, the space more attractive, what is going to make it different. Um, and one of the key elements of the beach in Detroit was this little beach bar. It has a liquor license, so, you know, there is cocktails and beer, and they started in a little tent. That was in 2014. Um, in 2016, they upgraded to a container. And they're um, continually adding activities and elements to this whole space. They're adding games, um, a lot of different activities for different groups of people and different age groups. And you can also see how the space around the beach has also evolved. Now, we can claim that just this work has brought downtown Detroit back uh, from the brink, but we think that this placemaking effort has had a really important impact and it's spread out. So this is Cadillac Square. It's right next to Campus Marshes. We um, created some of the initial environments and you can see how they're evolving over the years. Now they have very fancy beer gardens, but they also have spaces that are completely open uh, and people can just use, and it's spreading into the office buildings around. So it's not just that you have a, a downtown park and you have room to improve it. Um, this is the Chase building. This is another office building across the street. So it's kind of spreading and spilling out of this core public space they recently added the queue line. I know Oklahoma City also has a streetcar now. Um, so the queue line has been really important in Detroit to bring people and to activate some of these spaces. And I'm hoping that's what your streetcar is going to be doing in downtown Oklahoma City as well. And the activities continue. So the story here is about how the space has been able to evolve and use the initial placemaking efforts and some of this initial funding and support to learn and evolve and grow. And that has always been our goal in uh, working with all of our partners and all of our grantees 
We have, at this point, a legacy of about 20 very successful public spaces, but we continue to build knowledge. We have a cohort and a learning practice and a community of learning, and we're all sharing our experiences and learning more and more from each other. And with that, I want to invite um, your own uh, Jill Delosier from downtown OKC, who I have to say have been one of the best partners we've worked in this program, and we're so excited about what they've done here, um, well, in downtown Oklahoma City. Jill. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if it's true that we're one of the best partners, but uh, I <laughs> But I, we, we appreciate the compliment. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit in depth about the project that we did through the Heart of the Community grant in downtown Oklahoma City. It is a space called Kerr Park. How many of you know where Kerr Park is? Okay, yay. We're totally going to take credit for that. Just kidding. Um, so quick little history about the park. Um, it was built in the early 70s and opened in 1975, um, part of the Kerr-McGee campus there. And um, it was used for public space, gathering, concerts, had a lot of water features and a lot of concrete at the time. And um, it, it was really well used until maybe the late 90s when it started falling into a little bit of disrepair. And the pavers were getting broken, the water fountains weren't really functioning. Um, Kerr McGee was long gone and Sandridge had taken on the challenge of re- installing some of those features, um, rehabbing the park, making it more useful for people. And they got a lot of partners on board for uh, financially and um, hired some architects and got some community buy-in, did all the things right, and um, started moving forward with a plan. So this is what the initial plan looked like for Kerr Park. Lots of trees, a, a center gathering area, and you can see seating and some shade, lots of people walking through, because um, they wanted to see people come back to the space and start using that as the central area that it was intended to be. However, uh, ran into some recession and people pulled some money out, um, had to be reallocated elsewhere, and so um, some of these ideas got pulled back. And uh, this is when the park was under construction. It ended up taking a little bit longer than expected and um, some of the ideas that needed more money weren't gonna be able to happen. But um, Sandridge really did step up and they have offered to and continue to maintain the park space even though it is property of the Oklahoma City Parks and Rec Department. So they have a great partnership there already, even before we started talking about the grant. So um, they started working on the construction. And here's when it was completed in 2016, an aerial view. Um, so again, pristine, beautiful, um, lots of sidewalks. They did a bunch of ADA improvements, which were really important because before there had been lots of stairs and access issues. Um, so all of the plaza areas and new trees were planted, but nobody came to the park. Um, people were confused exactly like who it belonged to, if they were supposed to be there, could they play sports on the grass, they weren't really sure. So we actually thought that this would make a perfect proposal for the heart of the community grant. Um, it, it is literally in the heart of the community in downtown Oklahoma City. And um, some of the grant criteria really spoke to us in what we're trying to do for the community. Um, Laura spoke about resilience and um, unfortunately, in Oklahoma City, we are all too familiar with that, and um, some of the problems and, um, and things that have happened in our community, weather-related, terrorism, things like that. So um, that was a huge part of what we wanted to create, is a new space where people can gather and make those human connections and feel comfortable enough to make this space their own. And as downtown residential numbers are growing, we're seeing more people live downtown, 
um, we also wanted to make this a backyard for those folks who live downtown. So here are some of the issues that um, we kind of talked about before we got started, things that we knew that we needed to address. Low usage of the space, people were definitely walking through and getting from place to place, but the Parkside building that's featured here um, was built and not immediately used or leased, so it was sitting empty. Um, the south side of the park faces the back door to a bunch of downtown businesses, and so the most activity that was really seen was people walking out for smoke breaks and then going right back in. Um, and there's no smoking allowed in this park. So um, they were basically just standing next to the park looking at it. Um, uh, it was a little bit sterile, again, because some of those amenities and trees had to be dropped from the plan. Um, and then we took into account some community issues that we needed to address and how placemaking can really make a positive impact on those. So. Um, in Oklahoma, we have a lot of poor health indicators. We don't walk a lot, and we don't spend a lot of time outside, and everyone blames the weather, but um, we've seen in other cities that it's not really the weather, it is protection from the weather and level of comfort. So if you add things like shade or protection from rain or wind, um, people actually will go outside a lot more. So we thought that we might be able to make a difference there as well. Education challenges, this is another thing that our state um, has to deal with quite a lot. And so we partnered with several downtown schools and other educational programs and universities to assist us with programming and we wanted to make sure that they were involved in the process as well. And unfortunately, because this park had um, just been maintained and not really activated, there wasn't a plan. There weren't a lot of community partners already talking to the Parks Department or Sandridge about how can we use that space. Um, so we wanted to make sure everyone knows Kerr Park is open for business. It is free. It is open to the public. You can use it. Um, it's really safe because Sandridge had put in, um, again, a lot of lighting and um, necessary improvements for access. And they have been working really closely with the Parks Department to make sure that um, it was accessible to everyone. So project goals, um, activating an underutilized area, kind of placemaking 101, um, creating a welcoming public space. Again, that was a challenge that when the park first reopened, they were trying to make sure that the grass was going to grow and seed and be successful so they had to put up ropes around it but then the public was confused does that mean I can never use this grass or is this temporary so communicating that to the public that Kerr Park is for you and um, it's open um, revitalizing the area trying to give an economic boost to um, places that are downtown near the park and um, again, we can't take, take credit for it, but that Parkside building has since sold and um, a major company is moving downtown into that space and they're very excited about using the park for not only employee events, but for the community. So um, I'll talk about that here in just a second. Another goal of ours that was really important is to include all populations. Um, we are realistic and we know that downtown Oklahoma City has received a lot of attention and a lot of funding over the past couple of decades and that there was some downtown fatigue. People were like, ugh, downtown's getting all the money, they have all the cool stuff. Um, but we thought maybe if we include other people in the conversations that maybe downtown would start to feel more like it was supposed to be, that downtown is truly for everyone. But we can't build a park for everyone if they are not telling us what they want. So we made that a huge priority to reach out to different populations than what we typically see in this industry. And get the neighborhood involved. I mentioned that the um, population of downtown, those who live downtown, has really grown over the past few years, and um, how are they going to use it on a daily basis? The actual process, um, first we talked to our partners, so we talked to Sandridge and the City of Oklahoma City, both the Planning Department and the Parks and Rec Department, about what can we do as a team um, if we were to receive this grant from Southwest and the technical assistance from PPS, um, what's the dream situation? 
So got lots of those types of partners on board, and then also local arts organizations and uh, other nonprofits and um, spreading the word about how this park can be used. We hosted workshops and we met with stakeholders, so all the property owners that were nearby and um, people who had invested in the park. We talked to the Kerr Family Foundation and made sure that they um, were in favor of everything that we were gonna be doing there and upholding their family legacy. And then we um, took all of these ideas that we got from the community workshops and our meetings and started designing and creating taking all those ideas and putting them together to see what it would look like. The community engagement portion cannot be stated enough um, how important that was to the process. If we had just uh, received money from Southwest and talked to PPS and then threw some furniture out there, um, it may or may not have been successful. Um, seating and shade were the number one things that people said that they wanted, which didn't surprise us, but there were other types of stories um, that people were telling us through these workshops that we could not have known and we and we wouldn't have thought of. Um, and some people were asking for the moon and, and wanting all kinds of things that we can maybe work toward in the future. Um, so kind of taking, taking these grand ideas and putting them together in uh, a budget and planning for long-term maintenance and programming is, is kind of where we went with that. We also did an online survey, so if people couldn't come to our community engagement workshops, they were able to give us feedback that way. We put um, our phone number and email on everything, so if anybody had ideas, um, they were um, able to reach out to us. And then we got uh, lots of media involved, um, lots of local newspapers, um, radio stations, bloggers, things like that, um, really wanted to hear from us on what was happening here. Here's a little sketch at the top of what we first envisioned and then PPS took it and put it into a nicer looking plan. Here is an architect's rendering from uh, Common Works Architects, I'm sure they're here today, um, of a pavilion that, that would be not only for shade and um, you know you could put seats under it and things like that, but it's also a work of art. So we wanted to make sure that we incorporated lots of local artists and we're able to showcase our unique culture and history. Here's launch day, this is last August, so um, it, it really came together pretty quickly. There were some challenges that every project is gonna face. Most of ours were timing challenges. Um, ordering the furniture, they were like, oh, it'll be here in four weeks. It'll be here in 12 weeks, but um, that's okay. Um, Southwest was very gracious and patient with us, and um, some of the things you just have to be kind of realistic about. Um, we weren't going to compromise on the quality of products that we put out there because we knew it was going to have higher usage than ever before, um, and we wanted it to be perfect. Um, didn't want any more confusion about this space when it relaunched again. So this was last August, and this is the budget. So. Um, like I said, we invested quite a bit in the workshops and the data collection just because it informed almost everything that we were going to do. Um, we spent money on furniture and games, obviously, and um, landscaping and art. So we worked with the Parks Department to pick plants and shrubs and even down to which concrete planters would be best for the area um, and use their expertise on um, not necessarily native plants, but plants that could and would thrive in an urban area and in Oklahoma. So some drought resistant things and trying to get some color infused as well. Then the pavilion itself was $86,000 and it's more than we could have ever dreamed up um, on our own. So um, it has electricity that runs in there, so it has all kinds of cool lighting and we can host concerts there, but most of the time we're seeing people just self-program and using that to have lunch and uh, meetings right there in that space. Creating a sense of place, um, so reminding the community of Kerr Park's location or telling them for the first time, maybe if they're new to Oklahoma City um, or new to downtown, 
put it on the map, and I say literally because um, there were, like Google had taken it off their map while it was under construction, and um, so we had to kind of, it was almost like a new park after, after it was reopened. I mentioned infusing local art, working with artists to decorate everything that stands still there. Um, not just the pavilion, but our ping pong table um, is hand painted and meant to be repainted with new art every couple of years. Create photo opportunities. We know that that's a big part of how young people interact with their environment is taking photos and um, making memories that way. And we picked out branding and color palettes that went with the furniture and the ads that we were promoting. Diversity and inclusion, again, this was probably our number one item that we considered throughout the entire process. How do we make sure that everyone's voices are heard? And um, really the key is you have to reach out. If you want to hear everyone's voice in the community, you can't just say, well, here's this public meeting, hope you show up. You have to call them, you have to email them and say, we need your input on this, it's important that you be here, and that worked. Um, we were just talking backstage about some new ways that people are trying to get public engagement, but I think there's just something to be said about that personal outreach that we need to hear your voice in this conversation. Um, all types of abilities, everything that we picked, we wanted to make sure that people um, who had a stroller or a bike or a wheelchair or a little bit older or even young kids could all sit in and use the furniture and the ping pong tables, the picnic tables. We also put um, some cornhole games out there, bocce ball, and a big community table um, that, that people can use for meetings or meals. And those experiencing homelessness. So this was kind of a tricky topic for us. Um, we brought in some homeless service providers from Oklahoma City into the conversation um, because homelessness has been on the rise in a lot of cities. And um, one of the questions that we kept getting from stakeholders and other folks was, how are you gonna keep the homeless people out of the park? And we said, we're not. This park is truly for everyone. And when we say that, we mean, every socioeconomic status, every um, type of person. And so um, there is lighting and security in the park and it's very safe and we want to make sure that it continues to be that way. But um, everyone was in agreement that we're not gonna shoo people out of this park. They can use it just like anybody else would. And um, it's been quite lovely. We have a story of a woman who spends a lot of time there during the day and um, she, kind of watches out for things that are happening in the park and moves furniture back and things like that. Um, but also, every once in a while, someone will walk through and invite her to play ping pong. And so those human connections um, are really the, the best goal that we could have hoped to achieve. I mentioned all of the amenities. We did put a lot of cafe tables and chairs, and Elena talked about how important it is that they're movable. Um, some of the chairs are so heavy that they can't be moved, but that was an accident. Um, but m most of them are, like the cafe tables and chairs, you know, if you have fewer or more people you want to add to your group, you can make it your own. Um, shade, again, um, the picnic tables that are out there have a retractable shade over the top, so if you want the sun, you may have it, and if you need shade, you can do that yourself. On the programming side, we've partnered with the Greater OKC Chamber, ULI has had meetings out there, Echo Energy is the new tenant in that building, and this is a poster of one of their movie nights um, for Hitchcock in the Park. And they're moving in this summer, I believe, and they're gonna start doing more of these types of things for the community. Um, Spread the Love was a body positive image event, and we were proud to host them there. Arts Council um, had been doing programming there many years ago, and so we asked them to start coming back and doing some of their um, lunchtime concerts and out-of-the-box programming. And City Care is a homeless service provider that we partnered with um, to do an event in this space as well. So here's a couple of pics. Here's some, this is a rain poem that is, um, it's clear paint that you put, it's more technical than that. You put it on the dry sidewalk and then when it rains, um, that part stays dry. So it'll show up um, when it rains. You can see this piece of art that we installed. And there's some people playing games there. 
the impact, how we measured what we were able to achieve there and continuing to measure. We have pedestrian counters that we installed as part of the grant and that's been really helpful. It compares it with the weather and um, days of the week so we can say, oh, Monday mornings, it's really popular and Friday afternoons and on days when it's sunny, obviously. Um, but it really gives us a lot of information to work with. The length of stay in park has also gone up. Types of visitors to the park, we are noticing a lot more diversity. And updates to some of the nearby buildings. We've had several companies on Park Avenue reach out to us and say, we wanna do public art, we wanna do a mural because it's now facing this park. Um, so we're hoping to see more grow in that area. And then self-programming, this is kind of my favorite thing. Um, when people bring their kids out there and pack a dinner and um, I was actually out there with my family one night having dinner and saw two other families that did the same thing so um, that's really special when you start seeing birthday parties uh, engagement photos things like that whoever has the first wedding in Kerr Park can I be invited I like <laughs> I'll totally cry um, and this is an ongoing happy hour group, um, and probably lots of you are in the audience. Can I get a what's up? Um, and, and so I, I love that people are truly using the space as we hope they would. Um, going forward into the future, this is Bruce from Curbside Chronicle, and um, he is part of their flower sales program, and they are going to partner with us and the Parks Department and do Flower Fridays, so you can buy flowers at Kerr Park this spring, and um, maintenance is still being done by Sandridge, and the Parks Department comes out and fixes anything that needs to be done, and then we maintain the amenities, so it is truly um, lots of people with their eyes on this space and taking care of it. More programs, more events to come, um, some environmentally friendly aspects. We installed doggy waste stations recently. Um, so people, people are using it and um, we're just kind of watching and waiting and hearing back from them on what they uh, would like to see. And then um, we hope that this inspires people um, to help not necessarily replicate this exact effort, but do something similar in your own communities or elsewhere in Oklahoma and help continue the advocacy of placemaking, why it is so important, how it not only stimulates the economy, but gives people a sense of health and happiness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jill, Elena, and Laura. That was a fantastic presentation of a great uh, placemaking partnership and a great placemaking uh, process. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions and answers, and I'm gonna start with the first uh, question and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, I'm curious about the grant making process. How do you apply for a grant? What sort of criteria are there to receive one? I think Tulsa wants one. Um, I don't know, maybe some other communities here. Thank you for um, asking that. Um, yes, we, um, we kind of discovered that the best way, obviously, again, in a national large company of ours really really wanting with the initial goal to um, develop a public space or support a public space in every single one of our markets was to have a true open grant application process. Um, that application process was traditionally open around the fall time period. Um, organizations would submit their questions and inquiries and um, interest to our friends at PPS um, and then apply online. And, and again, it was basic, basic mandatories, like you had to be in a community that Southwest flu. Um, you, your, it had to be an outdoor public space within, a, again, the downtown sort of corridor or, or a very active urban hub of your community. And we really chose those um, areas because we really felt like that was um, the best fit with Southwest and where we really felt, felt like um, our dollars could make the most impact. Um, and then um, we have um, a whole review process that goes through some of that grading criteria and grant criteria um, that I spoke about earlier 
earlier. Um, and truly, it did, did create a process that allowed us to find um, great partners like Downtown OKC Partnership um, that were partners that already had a real established presence in the community that were very collaborative in nature, had really great relationships in place, and so they could really activate quickly um, and put these plans into action. Um, we are currently, um, the grant program is currently focus, focusing our investment right now on PPS. Um, I think all of us, Southwest and PPS, are, are growing and evolving and changing. We want to make sure that our investments create sustainable partnerships and work for the future. And so we're really doubling down into our investment um, with PPS and ensuring um, their work and placemaking um, lives far, far beyond um, their, their many years um, in, in the issue area. So um, always uh, can visit um, PPS's website, pps.org, backslash heart of the community to learn more about the program as well as um, any grant opportunities that may exist. Okay, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Don't be bashful. Tom, put them. So Fort Worth has an interesting history. It's the location in 2011 of Occupy OKC. And I was looking for, I, I didn't see your mention of that in your presentation. So, so, so the question is, uh, uh, Kerr Park was the location for Occupy Downtown OKC, yeah, Occupy, OKC. Occupy OKC, and that, uh, the, and uh, you know, you didn't mention that. Would you like to comment? Yes. Yeah. I didn't have enough time, um, but yes, it it has actually been a really important piece of property in downtown Oklahoma City for a long time where people have used it to demonstrate. Um, just in the past couple of years, we've seen um, water issues, native issues, and then of course the Occupy OKC movement have staged there at Kerr Park. And um, we wrote it into the grant that it is important and we want to continue that. Um, so in no way were we trying to stop that activity from happening. We're actually really proud of it. Um, and so we, we hope that people do continue to use the space for all kinds of public expression. Okay, other question? Anyone? Sir. Uh, so, uh, first of the more creating uh, Okay, so the, the question was, the question was, what, what are some, more, some of the more creative placemaking ideas you've seen throughout the world? I don't think I, I can give you like one that's like, that's the most creative idea. I think you go online and there's like a million sites and a million um, examples. What we have been doing at uh, PPS, Project for Public Spaces, is we were trying to keep this gallery of um, good, lighter, quicker, cheaper examples, and some of them are very creative, and there is art and incredible artistic expression, and some of them are very practical and down-to-earth, and we need to close this street so we can play in it. Um, so again, I would direct you to the website, but there is a whole universe out there of creative placemaking. There is actually um, a, a whole branch of placemaking in public art, and there is a lot of interesting examples there. So I would say look there. My personal favorite is actually from um, a, a program that we ran with um, OCLC. It's the um, Online Consortium for Library Cooperatives. It's basically an organ umbrella organization that works with libraries. And we worked with really small rural libraries. And they had $5,000 to do something. So we had one library created a canoe rental. That was their placemaking thing. They bought canoes. And people could rent canoes with their library card. And another one. Uh, partnered with the local astronomy club that had just bought a really fan fancy telescope. So they were doing sky, sky gazing. So I think the sky is the limit in terms of how creative people can be. <laughs> uh, but I, I just wanted to add to the wh where does the funding come from and what are um, grant potentials. We're always looking to connect with other partners and we're looking to um, be of 
assistance to cities and communities that want to invest in their downtown spaces. It doesn't have to be us but we believe that this is the single most important investment a city can make to uh, make itself more livable, more diverse, more inclusive, bring businesses, support retail, because public spaces do all of that. So I'll leave you with that. Go and place make in your own community. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. And I think that's a, a, a good place uh, <coughs> to... Uh, uh, end. And I want to uh, thank uh, Jill and Elena and Laura for their presentations this morning. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Uh, okay, so for one moment here, I need you to give your attention to Shane Hampton, who has some important announcements before we break for lunch. Okay, this was a great, this has been a great morning so far. I hope you guys are all full of ideas. Uh, from both Kennedy's presentation and um, from our friends at Project for Public Spaces in Southwest and downtown OKC. I think it really shows something special when organizations like Southwest Airlines are taking note of the placemaking movement and seeing how it benefits their business. Uh, groups like AARP Oklahoma that's a sponsor today, maybe groups that we maybe didn't think would be interested in our, in our efforts of public spaces, but public space really does impact people of all walks of life. Um, I want to um, uh, also share a, another opportunity. So if the Heart of the Community grant isn't the perfect fit for your community, I don't know that Southwest Airlines goes to all 77 counties in, uh, in Oklahoma. Um, one opportunity is through AARP Oklahoma and AARP National that is really about uh, building livable communities for people of all ages. Uh, it also gets to the idea of those lighter, quicker, cheaper projects, the quick action type grants. And uh, this is an opportunity, I believe the grant cycle is open right now until April 17th. Um, so uh, we have a short video available about the AARP grant. They've actually already supported uh, projects in uh, Venita, Oklahoma, just uh, last year, and also in Shawnee, Oklahoma. So Oklahoma communities have uh, successfully won this grant. I think over 3,000 communities have applied in the last couple of years. But this is certainly a program that would apply to um, communities of any size in the state. And we'll see if we can queue up the video here. The match will help all of us. All ages and all abilities can benefit from this kind of technology. We're trying to understand what are the best ways to reach out to the older population, but then also to the rest of the community. We want people to succeed in our communities, whether they're 5, 50, or 150. We don't give the grantees a lot of time to put this together. Uh, and that's intentional, so that the community can really come together, coalesce around a project, and get it done. The mats are portable, non-slip, roll-up beach mats, and will serve our needs for years to come. None of this would have been possible without AARP's help. The lighting was one of the biggest pieces that the community wanted to see, not only within the park, but just generally within the, the neighborhood. The challenge grant is helping us look at wayfinding in the buildings that we're more likely to see our older adults enter. It's really hard to put a number or a dollar amount on a project that really just improves and beautifies a space, which is why the grant from AARP was a perfect match for this project. The AARP grant has allowed us to study different ways to incentivize seniors to participate in our Via Rideshare program and our Jump Bike Share programs. I'm all signed up and ready to go. It's a pilot program called My House, My Home, and it's designed specifically to work with uh, low-income senior homeowners who are at risk of losing their house. So this is a more playful approach to our typical bus stop shelters. It's going to allow some of our seniors to have a seat while they're waiting for the bus. So I think it's an absolute fabulous idea. The small investment of money is going to reap tremendous rewards for the community for years to come. We're 
honored to be selected to get the grant, and we will put it to good use, I can guarantee you that. Thank you, thank you ARP, yeah. So I would encourage you all to check, uh, check out the Community Challenge website to see if your community might have an idea waiting for some funding. Um, another opportunity, uh, as Hans alluded to earlier, is our uh, col collaboration with the Oklahoma Municipal League, uh, which works all across the state. They help us provide matching funds to communities to get conceptual design assistance. If you go to our website, iqc.ou.edu, right on the front page, you'll see a link that says propose a project in your community, and our applications are open until April 18th. Uh,